Females don't like bodybuilders. They all think all we do is eat chicken and rice. We're boring. We take steroids so we're angry. And we've got massive egos. <laughs> and small and small nuts. And yeah, and apparently <laughs> everybody, everybody that's does. True. Why do you choose to work a full-time job if you're doing that well as a coach? Like, why don't you just... Yeah. So if you're not that person, I'd be like, well... What's really, what's really going to be important to you for the rest of your life? Yeah. I remember, maybe when I was about 23, 24, I remember the idea of me competing kind of coming into the mix and which is really funny, people that was in Cheaters at the time would say, Jake will never compete, he's got no legs. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting now. Welcome to another episode of, well, it's a Fuel Your Craft podcast, I suppose. Yeah, just it, was, it was Lean Whiskies and it's by Building, then it was Wise and I don't know what it is now. No, yeah, just an epic, epic podcast with epic, epic people. Podcast. A new name every time. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> um, we're here today, blessed with the presence of Jake Watts and not so blessed with Marcus, <laughs> so my blessed. COO, yeah. good friend. That's not very kind. I love him to bits. Never <laughs> um, Jake... I should give you a bit of introduction. I've known you for a fair few um, years now. Do you know what? I was thinking about this earlier and I was thinking, when did we first meet? It's got, we've got to be going back a good eight, maybe seven, eight years. Must be. I mean, I feel like it's been that time. I was actually trying to think, when did we first meet? But I can't actually remember. I mean, he's one of the guys, you know, where everyone talks about like in your local vicinity, not many successful people. And there, to be honest, isn't. Jake is someone that is. Well, two of us have, have been grafting hard, building our empires in isolation. Not never actually yeah. done any businesses together, yeah. but with um, no coaching. So, yeah, obviously been scaling that out, and you've been very successful in the coaching business while also running another business and also being a successful bodybuilder yourself. Um, he's a really nice guy. Which is why I speak to you. I don't speak to you. Yeah, he just has to say that. <laughs> no, no, no. I <laughs> yeah. the compliments I for you. I, I genuinely don't speak to many people. Plus, the bodybuilding community, as we know, can be a little bit uh, intense. Toxic. Uh, can be toxic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to be. I was being polite. <laughs> um, and obviously, I've transitioned out of that, but I've still stayed in contact with you, yeah. um, even though you do every now and then try and pull me back in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you've got an unbelievable coaching business, which actually has a community, and I work with a lot of coaches, right? Yeah. So, obviously, I've the journey you've been on and the seeing the way you've grown your coaching business that what you've done particularly well is build a community of people everywhere and where's your stuff there's a lot yeah. of people locally that are being coached by you and are involved with what you do we've done gym um shoots with you where the whole fucking gym is taken over by everyone <laughs> that turns up in yeah. in in your um, amplified nutrition yeah we've had a few sundays where yeah. you've been in there and it's just <laughs> like, <laughs> welcome to the other way like we videoed you i mean we've, we've videoed you as well like so yeah. we've, we've been there and it's been it's been insane to watch your journey and now one thing that you and i've had a chat we're now both old bastards <laughs> and are we the same age how old are you now 32 i'm 33 so i'm an old yes bastard. An older <laughs> bastard. Um, <laughs> and we've obviously talked we've been through the everything's about bodybuilding Everything's about work. Now, potentially, both of us trying to find a bit more balance. We both have silly cars now. We've both done well, yeah. but we and we have a lot of common ground. But it'd be like nice to. I thought it'd be really good to have a chat to you because I know a lot of young lads that are following in your footsteps yeah. might not necessarily know some of the pitfalls that they might be falling into right now. Some of the things you might have done differently. Same for me as well. Obviously, yeah. I've as we talk about all the time, I'm, I'll downsize massively. Yeah. Um, I have to say that because it's making me feel a little bit <laughs> <laughs> all over it. I'm the biggest one like, here today. <laughs> <laughs> I've downsized massively. I'm now like treating my body as a an engine for me to perform rather than me fueling my body. Yeah. Um, so it's fueling me and my, my, my journey and, and what I'm trying to do. And I know you're going on to, and we had a chat the other day, like you're almost having that same transitional period. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think, as you just said about kind of, we've probably kind of done that same transition yeah. together. Almost, we've You're kind a bit of slow because you are that year older. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, but we've gone through that transition of us both really heavily doing the bodybuilding, like you say, going into business, still kind of ticking along with the bodybuilding. But I think you've kind of started to venture out a little bit more, where I'm still stuck in it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, well, the difference is, I think your business was predicated on. Bodybuilding, of course, absolutely. Whereas I never actually made money directly from coaching. Bodybuilding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I certainly didn't make it from bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, agreed. Don't have your legs. <laughs> Not for one of trying. Thanks for that. So yeah, I mean, where where's your head at now? So do you want to give people a little bit of a backstory of like where you started, what you've done, because and where you're at now, just so that people. Yeah, cool. So I think so for me, without kind of going too deep, but. I first started going to the gym when I was probably 19, 20, and, you know, I don't know if it was the same for you, but... Can you cross your legs like this, by the way? Uh, no, so oh, I've cool. literally <laughs> just started being able to cross my legs like this, it. and now I do it all the time, I'm like... That's what I... I have to do to try and put my shoes on, I'm like this. <laughs> um, Sorry, carry on. But, um, yeah, so I think for me, for kind of gym journey started when I was probably about 20, um, I hated how I looked. That's kind of where it started. Yeah. I was, I think I was eight stone at the age of yeah, 19, 20, um, which I, I was literally skin and bone. So it kind of started there. I kind of started to get into the gym. Um, and then, you know, as time kind of went on, I was training at Cheetahs back in the day, which I'm sure you'll remember. Love Cheetahs. Um, bit, bit spit and sawdust spit gym. And stored, yeah. yeah, spit and sawdust gym. Um, you know, surrounded by bodybuilders at that time. I mean, it was hardcore bodybuilders. It like, was, this yeah. Is back in the day, bodybuilders. Proper, proper like... bodybuilding. Um, you know, I was kind of starting to get into it, starting to enjoy it. And I, I remember probably maybe when I was about 23, 24, I remember kind of the idea of me competing kind of coming into the mix and people actually, which is really funny at the time, people that was in Cheetahs at the time would say, Jake will never compete, he's got no legs, which <laughs> is quite interesting now based on the conversations we were having just before we started. Well, so um, no, that's not a problem anymore. Yeah, right? absolutely. So that was probably a little bit of a driver for me because I was like, okay, like, you know, I know you're quite similar. I like to prove people wrong. Um, is something Me? that, <laughs> um, you know, so that's kind of where it really started to kind of go into bodybuilding. It went from being, I'm going to the gym to, I want to get into bodybuilding now. First competed in 2015, um, finished second, great start kind of. And from there, it just kind of escalated. And that's probably where I started to get that passion for coaching. Um, you know, I kind of was like, okay, I'm really into this now. I'm really enjoying this. And then I kind of just started to learn. That's kind of where it picked up from from that point. And I think, I think what's probably different to me to I think a lot of the industry in terms of online coaching at the moment, and I'm sure you will see this obviously with your mentoring and stuff. That at that time, online coaching wasn't a thing. So it no, you're, was, you're an OG. Yeah, like it, it wasn't a thing. You know, I think a lot of people now get very attracted to the financial aspect that online coaching can give you, um, and I think. A lot of people now don't necessarily do it for the want of passion. I think there's also there's an element of people see the financial gain that can be gained from it, and that's kind of why they jump into it. Whereas for me, I was like, I actually love this. Like, I really like this. And then, you know, I started to help a few people. I was probably coaching, you know, five, ten people at the time in about 2017, and it kind of just carried on escalating. I was like, you know what? I, I, I'm actually quite good at this. Like, I'm a, I'm actually doing all right. You know, I was getting normal lifestyle people that mm. were going through, you know, four or five month transformations, losing two, three stone. And it, it just escalated from there. Um, you know, I think I first started prepping people probably six years ago now, um, which, it, which is madness. Like you say, I feel like an OG um, because I've you been are. doing it for such a long time now. Um, you know, you've got people, like I say, that are just kind of starting that journey now of, you know, getting into the realms of online coaching, whereas I've been doing it for such a long time now. Um, so it kind of, escalated from there um i've been prepping people yeah for five six years now um, i'm gonna chuck my accolades in there just because i want to <laughs> um but um yeah i'm pushing i've got four pro cards obviously nick being one of them that you obviously yeah. know know well um i've had over 200 top three placings now which it, to me is crazy um you know i'm putting people in shows and it, it's like the expectation is they will place you know if i get a second or third place now i'm almost like oh that's disappointing, whereas four years ago, I'd be like, oh my God, like, this is amazing. Um, so that's kind of where it's kind of started and got to for me now. And, you know, I'm, at the moment, you know, I'm not going to blow my own trumpet too much, but I'm probably one of the most well-known prep coaches in the UK at the moment. Um, Without a doubt. Yeah, you know, so it, that's kind of where it's gone from where it is now, really. And no doubt it's actually obviously done you extremely well. For it you, has, y yeah. I think, I think I'd probably say now consistently for the last three, four years, I've been pushing on over 100 clients consistently um that hasn't really dropped you know it kind of you know ups and down but as a rule like that that's where i kind of stick at now is no, i mean i've spoken to you a few times and you 
you've also run like a full-time job alongside yeah. this as well which most people don't realize <laughs> yeah, so. A lot, so many people don't realize that and people when people hear it they're like huh um yeah so i have a full-time job um still um so i work for lloyd's bank at the moment job title with my lead business analyst um so i run that alongside alongside my like, business yeah beauty which, and brains <laughs> yeah which is it's and i've done it for as i say four or five years now and people always are just like how do you manage that but you know, you'll know based on how much you manage yourself. Like, I'm just somebody who, I'm just relentless. That's the best way for me to describe it. I am just relentless. Like, you know, I know we've spoken in the past around mm. people saying about like needing rest and that kind of stuff, but we strive off of not resting, um, you know, and people, people will sit and say, you need a break, you need a break. Do you know what? I've had a break the, the last week over Christmas and I probably feel the most run down I've ever felt because I've stopped. Um, when I'm just relentless and working consistently all the time, it works for me. Yeah, for those that follow me, I know that every Friday, it's a, it's a thing we push out, like uh, 3.30 on a Friday, there's just about 34% of your entire week left. Yeah, That's when we fucking start, because yeah. that's when everyone else is fucking <laughs> yeah. ready to go to sleep. It's so true. And that's the, that's the attitude that guys like us have. It is. And yes, to be fair, there is an argument for we maybe overcook it. Yeah. And the reason we get ill is the way I, I, I the analogy I use is like we're in a boxing ring we're at war every single day yeah. and when you're getting hit it doesn't hurt yeah. when you come out and have a bit of a rest you, you, your, your wounds start to become a little it's bit true. sore and you get a bit tight and then the thought of getting back in the ring gets a bit harder so we just fucking pal and it is it's so true like I, I've not actually been ill this year until I've taken time <laughs> off I'm exactly the yeah. same which is crazy you know literally I, I had my first week off between Christmas and New Year from coaching in, in five years I've never taken a week off. Even when I go on holiday, I still deal with all my clients. And it's the first week. I was like, you know what? I'm going to actually take a week off. I said to all my clients, I'm going to have a week off. Like, if you really need me, message me. But otherwise, no check-ins. I'll have to spend the whole week ill. Because I'm, and I genuinely think that's because I've stopped. And as soon as I start back up again, I probably won't be ill again for the next however long. Um, and you say you've been the same. Oh, mate, every time. Yeah. <laughs> every time. Why do, you, um, why do you choose to work a full-time job at the same time as doing the coaching? So there'll be a lot of people watching this that are just like, if you're doing that well as a coach, like why don't you just focus on Do you on know what? It's thing? really difficult for me to give you the real why. Uh, so I, do, I, I like my job. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference to me. Yeah. Um, and I think stopping my job, I wouldn't feel busy enough. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that 100 client barrier... I like that. For me to push that to the 150, 200 mark, I'm not sure I would enjoy it. Right. And I'll be pro I'll be honest with you. There's probably an element of me that, not scared, but I'm like, well, I can balance it. I like it. I don't dislike it. You know, I don't yeah. wake up and hate my job. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of like, well, I can manage them both. So why would I stop? Yeah. Um, and I don't. Of course, you know. Of course. It, the financial aspect is good. I have a good job. I get paid a lot of money. Um, so that, that obviously helps. But I'm like, I, for me, my view and my goal has always been, I want to work towards not financial freedom, but freedom. So for me, you know, eventually I'm, I'm, I'm getting my job will stop and I will leave my job. Yeah. But for me right now, I'm just on that pursuit to get that freedom and I mm -hmm. want to be in a position where I can do what I want when I want and I don't quite feel that I'm there yet. Yeah. Um, so I think when I am there will be the time I pull myself away. But yeah. I still believe, and I don't know what it is, there's something else for me to do, and I, but I don't know what that is yet. Yeah, it's interesting because we obviously, I'd say the majority of people that we work with, particularly coaches, mm -hmm the full-time job they have is the thing that they hate and it's the thing that they're actively trying to move Correct. away from. Yeah, I don't think the full-time job for you, though, is the thing that's actually making or, or the reason you're actually doing it. So no. you alluded it to there, and I'm a very much the same. I would say that potentially you have felt, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you kind of nailed coaching now. Yeah. So when you started coaching, I'm guessing it was the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. You had that, that novelty, that excitement for it. You've Absolutely. done extremely well at it. And... It's like with anything, right? When you get to the top of your game, and you are at the top of your game when it mm. comes to coaching, guys like us need progression. Yeah. So there's a, another phase of, okay, if me adding another 50 coaches to this 
isn't going to fulfil me. I need something else. So then Correct. a void starts to open up. Correct. And the job is now filling that to a certain extent because it's giving you stimulus outside of that. Yeah. And we've had this conversation that actually maybe it's not the job, it's the type of job. So your current job is filling that void, but maybe that you move into another business area. Yeah. It could be e-commerce, it could be property, it could be something else where you Absolutely. can then actually make infinitely more money and actually start to build the financial security, yeah. which I think maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, does that no, sound? No, I, I absolutely agree. And I think one thing that I really strive off of is problem solving. Mm -hmm. And my job is very much based on that. Mm -hmm. Like I get a kick out of problem solving. Um, so that's probably what my full-time job gives me that coaching doesn't. Like you say, I can, co I can coach with my eyes closed now. Like, you know, if you want me to prep someone to put them on stage and them to look fantastic and win, I can do that. Um, you know, if I need to drop five stone out of someone for them to be out, I can do that. And I can do that without thinking because it, I've just, I have an approach and a method that just works. So I think coming back to what you've said, I think the, the full time job gives me, it still gives me that problem solving aspect that I don't think the fulfillment, like coaching would give me or fulfillment, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, it makes sense. sense. Is, is, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right in that sense. And I think that's why I say that I want something out. There's something else still for me to do. Yeah. I just don't know what that is yet. Um, and I think that's... Has bodybuilding got in the way of your successful coaching business, would you say? Would I say it's got in my way? I think at times, yes. I mean, you know, as we, it is a very successful coaching business. Um, do I or have I in the past put a lot of pressure on myself from a coaching, from a, my own bodybuilding aspect, absolutely. Um, I would probably say I'm now at the point where me competing and me stepping on stage again, I don't really care. You know, I did four shows last year. I had no intention of doing any. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't. I was, I was, a, I was, a, I was just dieting just to make myself feel a bit better and tidy up. And I was four weeks out, and I was like, yeah, I can ride this out for another four weeks, easy. You know, did one show, and I was like got into the overall and lost by a point and I was like, oh, I want to get that overall. So I went again and then I went again and then I went again. Um, so, and you know, if I look at that aspect, you know, would I have been at my, through that period, although I did find it relatively easy, mm. would I have been at my full potential from a coaching aspect during that period? You might be, someone might argue, maybe not. So I think in that aspect, it, yeah, it can get in the way. I think it's, what I probably would say when I'm bodybuilding and kind of in that prep phase, I kind of do what I need to do to move forward from a coaching standpoint, but mm -hmm. probably don't go over and above, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you use the personal bodybuilding journey, though, to fuel your marketing for your yes. business? Like, I, I personally, I think it makes a big difference to me that people are invested in my bodybuilding journey. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't know why. Um, I think, you know, it's good, you know, for people that want to go on stage, if they can see that the person who is coaching you can do it, then of course, you know, like somebody wouldn't, you know, if you wanted to, you know, learn how to play football, you, you wouldn't go and learn from somebody who teaches how to play rugby, right? You know, so you, I think that aspect helps that I've, I've walked the walk. Um, no, I absolutely don't believe that a prerequisite for someone to be a successful coach is that they have to compete. No. I do believe, however, that that person should at least have a very big interest in or be doing it themselves. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. And what's actually interesting is some of the best coaches, other coaches in the UK right now, aren't actually bodybuilders, which is interesting. You know, because if I think about some of the other top guys in the industry... I'm probably one of the only ones that's still continuously bodybuilding in some way, shape or form. Well, look, at the end of the day, we have to believe that someone can help us solve a problem, Yeah. right? So the quickest and easiest way to get a standard human, one human being to believe that another human being could do something is that they're actually doing that bloody thing. It's yeah. not a prerequisite, right? It's like, well, look, I want to fucking buy a Lamborghini. Yeah. I bought one. I can show you how. Yeah. It's a damn sight easy to go, look, I'm a very good wealth manager. I know how to build money. I'm driving this and microbike can definitely help you. Yeah, you might be able to, but selling that is way harder. 100%. So if you are looking for the easy route, and I'm like, well, I speak to a lot of coaches, mate. I've now coached over a thousand people to 5K a month plus. Yeah. Just 
take the easy wins. Yeah. Get yourself into shape. Like, yeah. it's not fucking hard, actually. Yeah. And it shouldn't be hard if you're a supposed expert at it. Well, yeah. And, I think and it's, it's probably going to make you live a little bit longer, too. Yeah. I feel better. So there's a few fucking wins there. Absolutely. Well. <laughs> and it's like, I always, I always say this thing of, I call it like apprentice talk. And I always say, like, I could sit here and say to you now, I'm a fantastic coach. I'm a fantastic bodybuilder. I can get you to where you want to be. But if I've got nothing to back that up, that's waffle, that's rubbish, really. Well, it right? just means your sell is much harder. Yeah. Because then you have to get out the proof. You have Correct. to get out of it. But that's you what just saying. fucking stand up and go, holy shit, that guy's in shape. That's what I'm saying. Where do I sign? You it walk comes to back the gym to proof. and you lift. Half the guys in there are going, how the fuck do I get your legs? Yeah. It's, and it is, it's proof. This is what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> you're exactly right, I think, when you talk about selling harder. Because, you know, it's like, as you just said, you know, if, you know, let's just use you as an example of your e commerce stuff. If someone wants to learn how to do e commerce, you do it. Mm -hmm. You do it. Like, but if you say, I can teach you how to do it, but I haven't done it myself, well, am I going to come to you for that? Of course. And also, like, I mentor a lot of coaches to build their businesses, right? That's a big part of the reason I still stay in shape. Yeah. So they can actually empathize with me and actually see that I'm still actually involved in that market. market yeah. Now, I do obviously like looking good and make it too. Who doesn't? Of course. And I love bodybuilding, so it just goes hand in hand. Yeah. But I will always have my toe in the thing that I'm at least selling. Selling, yeah. Because absolutely. it helps. Like yeah. We are very visually driven people and yeah. we tend to believe what we see. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, it's like... A standard. <laughs> so going back to that, I know that you obviously put bodybuilding first, but one major thing I see a lot of bodybuilders do, and I'm gonna hold my hands up here, mm. wholeheartedly. I have had periods in my life, in my early twenties, where bodybuilding for me was the number one priority. Number this was before yeah. kids, before marriage, so before family. Yeah. All I had to worry about was me. Yeah. And I had a very successful business. You know, I was comfortable. I was a millionaire at 21 from the businesses that I was doing, yeah. and I was sitting there like, got some really important business meetings today. And they were right in my gym time. Yeah. And I always train at one. And well, I was I training with a time, mate. I was training with Jordan Peters as well. Yeah. And like, we, he doesn't miss nah. gym time. <laughs> so they got moved yeah. or cancelled. And now I look back at that, I'm thinking, what the fuck were you doing? Now? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, and, and I've probably done that. You know, it, when you think about meal times or stuff like that, you know, like I might have been the past when been like, you know, when I've been in prep where someone wants a consultation at two o'clock, but uh, that, it'll be half two. <laughs> Because I need to eat it too. Because that's even my if time. that was like a cancellation, that's my time. That's yeah. hundreds of pounds. Yeah, that, thousands and potentially and, down the drain. And that's what I would used to have been like. So when you said actually earlier yeah. about where would my body, but that's in the examples where it would have come in the way. Whereas now, if someone wants, it, what time do you want it? Three, cool, perfect. It's three is. Like whereas in the past, mm, mm, no, I'm training at three o'clock. So, like, so if you would like to so the other coaches that are watching this that are in that period right now, yeah. they're like fucking bodybuilding is the only thing that matters to me. Like. It's very hard to see past the next five mm. years because bodybuilding is all that matters. And they've got a coaching business and that's going to be the thing that pays their bills, supports them, gives them financial freedom. You being that person back then when you yeah. cancelled that, you either cancelled that fucking thing or you tried to move it, what would you say to yourself? Don't. <laughs> like, the thing is for me, the way I see bodybuilding, now, it's my, I love it. It's my hobby. Yeah. You know, I love going to the gym. Um, you know, when I go there, I love being there. It's not like I have to go to a gym because I have to go. I love being there. But, Unless you are, unless you're actually going to earn a living and you are in that position where you are, you know, you've had 20 people tell you you are going to be the next big pro that's going to fucking tour the world and you're going to win this and win that. No, don't do it. Even so, mate. <laughs> the guys that I've been, that I, I, I mean, I've trained with everyone. Yeah, of course you have. And I've yeah. worked with a lot of them. And even, I know what you're going to say. I bet I know what you're going to say. <laughs> well, I'm going to say. That you can't make any money from it anyway. Well, there's two, two elements to this, right? The top bodybuilders that will basically, 20 people say they're going to turn pro that I fucking know what they're talking about. One, those people actually don't have to fucking train as hard as you and yeah. still turn pro. Yeah. So they can afford to actually put business first. Yeah. And secondly, there's no fucking money in it anyway. No, you're right. So yeah. those people win yeah. either way. So they can do both. Yeah. So if you're not that person, I'll be like, well, what's really, what's really going to be important to you for the rest of your life? Because yeah. trust me, if it's for women, if it's for everything else and actually respect for men in the gym, you looking in half decent shape and have a shitload of money is way more impressive to oh, anyone. everybody. Mate, <laughs> like, and, you know, if we're going to talk about, if we're going down to that route, and even if we talk about it from a female aspect, Fucking females fun. don't like bodybuilders because what they think is they all think all we do is eat chicken and rice, we're boring, we take steroids so we're angry, 
and we've got massive egos <laughs> and small and small nuts and yeah and apparently <laughs> everyone, everybody not true to the large extent <laughs> and every bodybuilder's got a small dick apparently but it's true but it's true like from a like like some guys have this view that they think that's what women like but women don't like that like you know you will have the only women in my opinion that actually like bodybuilders is women that are heavily into the gym normal everyday women do not like bodybuilders absolutely not i think every bodybuilder that's watching this think about the last 10 people that gave you a compliment right in terms of the way you look how many of them were men and how many of them were females <laughs> yeah. all geezers yeah. Geezers, you don't ever walk in the gym when you've got a vest on. You're in the best. <laughs> no women. You're in the best shape of your life, and all you'll do is some geezer will come up to you and go, "Mate, you're in good nick. You're in good nick." Do you know what? Actually, funny, exact funny thing. I went to um, I went to a rave in November, in um, in October in Manchester. It was in warehouse, so it was so sweating up, tops off, mate. All I did all night, geezers just going, "How much do you bench, mate? Mate, you're in great shape, mate. Fucking look at the size of you, mate. Look at the size." Mate, not no women that have got no interest in it whatsoever. It's no. just all geezers. You're exactly, it's exactly that. I mean, as I say, you walk around the gym and you're in good shape. You know, if I see you're walking around the gym and you're in your vest, mate, I'm like, mate, look at your fucking doubts. Do you know what I mean? Well, what's happened actually since I've downsized? So like, the, the shift for me has been, I've got real hell bent on building a fucking empire now, yeah. and I want to help as many people make as much money but as you can, and I want to make a lot of money doing that. Yeah. Right. So, that my thought process was. I can't stop my addictive personality. Like I need to have something crazy yeah. to control and I, that's just me and I'm accepting it. And I love that about yeah. me. So rather than how do I optimize to build as much muscle as humanly possible, it's how can I make my physique, my body serve me to help build my empire, yep. be a good dad, a good parent, a good husband, a good boss and have all the energy in the world and live a long time and feel great yeah. to build this empire. So I was like, right, okay, what do I need to do? So then I actually found a good friend of mine, Ed, who's an, a, a crazy scientist, doctor, and like specializes in performance right. enhancing, but performance enhancing, not <laughs> PDs, not drugs. <laughs> like, not drugs, but it's, well, there is some drugs, but it's pharmaceuticals to actually boost longevity, performance, yeah. psychology, and then also biohacking your lifestyle. So now I've basically got a team in my corner. But it was before I'd have a coach to get me as big as possible, I've got a coach to get me as, as healthy as possible. healthy as possible and as efficient at work as possible. Yep. So mate, we, we've got whole morning routines, bedtime routines, sunlight routines. But all my pills have just switched from getting massive to getting rich. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's true though. Yeah. <laughs> and like I just basically want to feel like last night, mate. I got up. I got up yesterday at four thirty. And then I finished my last call at 11 p.m. Yeah. And I still got to bed and went to work. I probably, I think, was still messaging Marcus at that time as well. Get up at the same time this morning and I'm fucking on it. Yeah. I've already done four or five calls this morning. We're on a podcast, you know. I'll work till like late tonight. Yeah. And I feel, I feel great. great. Yeah. I'm not aggy around my wife. I'm a good dad to my kids. I spend time with them and I've got energy. Yeah. So, and I'm making good money. Yeah. And, like you say, I go into the gym and now I get compliments from men and women. Yeah. I'm like, why the fuck did I do this before? <laughs> it's true, it's true though. Like from the body the bodybuilding aspect, it just it, it is just purely geezers just find it impressive because all most guys think that that's how they want to look. Most of the time. And most of the time that's coming from a jealousy perspective as well. Oh, Not yeah. even something of like I'm impressed, I'm like, fuck, I'm yeah. a little bit like that's yeah. what I want. Whereas you wanna <laughs> women don't look at you from a jealous perspective, no, you're in absolutely. shape. They go I like that, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, if I'm walking around the gym, I've just trained legs and I've got veins all over my legs. No, the girl's going to go, "Cord, you know what? Look at them tree trunks and all them veins all over." Them. I love that. It just ain't going to happen, <laughs> is it? Like, it just isn't. No one. Some geezer's going to go, "Fuck me, mate. Look at the size of your legs." Like, no girl's going to go, "Cord, yeah, look at them, lovely." Have just, you had um, any clients in the past where they've kind of they've started the bodybuilding lifestyle, looking to compete, and then the whole kind of life around that starts to unravel like real car crash yeah 100 percent. like and i think there is not enough um awareness in the industry mm. for the detrimental effects of bodybuilding mm -hmm. um you will see a lot of the time at the moment people go through this transition of i want to get on stage they get on stage and then uh, the aftermath is terrible mm -hmm. um you know when we and i'm talking you know depression eating disorders to the point where people ruin their life, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have to go through this big transition period of, you know, they binge and binge and binge, they gain loads of weight and they've got to try and get that off again. It, it, it's not good. 
you know, it's not, it's competing is not for the faint heart. Well, the I, look, I've been there and done it. You've done it, like, yeah. And I, I've look, I've I'll be totally honest with you. Like, I've been through all the periods mm. because I realise it's my personality type, and like when we understand who we are and how we we function, we can actually be better suited to to try and fix it. So. Mm. I went through the whole anorexic period because I was a fat kid and I took that. And I used to really give a fuck what people thought about me. That then transitioned into the gym and then all the craziness that ensued with that. And then the same now with business and everything else. So, but what happens is, is people that are, typically this is what I found, men that, and women that attach themselves to bodybuilding in a way is for a couple of reasons. One is because they're lacking identity. So they need to find identity and quite often they find that with bodybuilding. Yeah, they identify that. themselves as the big guy, the big woman, the strong guy, the strong yeah. woman, whatever it may be. And the other thing is a lack of control. So anyone that likes to control things or feels like they're getting out of control will very quickly gravitate towards bodybuilding because it is the most, out of everything I've ever done in my life, consuming sport because you control every moment you're awake, everything that you put in your mouth, everything that you do is calculated. There's no other sport like it. Yeah. You can control everything. And all of a sudden you have a sense of, I'm back on the steering one, back yep. on the reins. So if you feel like your life's getting out of whack, that then becomes your comfort zone. The trouble with that is you've taken something that's completely extreme and potentially at the extreme is very unhealthy mm. to be the place where you feel comfortable. Yep. And Absolutely. that then becomes very, very slippery. So you've aligned your identity with this thing. So in a social environment, that then becomes a thing that you feel that you have to Express. Be proud of yeah. and express. Yeah. And then attached to that is a very unhealthy lifestyle to be able to become that identity. Mm. Now, to unravel all of those things, I've done this. Yeah. Right? I have to firstly realize that I can't go from that to nothing because yeah. my personality type would sink straight into depression. Yeah. And I realized that to try and peel back years of me hammering this identity into myself and others, it's more yourself. It's coming from me because mm. no one really gives a fuck no. outside of you. Like if you lose 10, 10 kilos, 10, whatever it is, 10 stone off of muscle, no one, no one cares. cares. Of course they don't. Right? Yeah. So what I had to do is like re rejig this. And for a lot of the guys out there that are trying to look into this is business was my refuge. Mm. I, I thought, right, okay, well, I'm going to change the way I look to the way I dress. Yep. So I made it a positive thing to lose weight because it means I can start fitting into nice clothes, clothes and looking good, yep. working on my skin and making sure that I look, my complexion was better, my wrinkles look better, my hair looks better. Like, start focusing on those as an outlet for before getting as big and unhealthy as possible. possible. Then it was, okay, my physique and the, how I looked turned into how healthy I was and how well I'm functioning. Yep. And then got a doctor in that can then moder like moderate those things and test everything to make sure that I'm healthy, everything's running as it yep. should be, I'm sleeping well. And then it wasn't that you stop that, I just shifted it. Yeah. So what I did was I took an unhealthy identity, what, what I thought was an unhealthy identity yeah. for me. I'm not saying that everyone that does this is unhealthy no. and I'm not saying the way everyone lives it is unhealthy. It was for me because yeah. my fucking blood work wasn't good. Well, it can my, be physically, markers... <laughs> physically mentally, yeah. in, in any different aspect, right? It can be super healthy if you've done the right way. For me, it wasn't. And a lot yeah. of people we're talking about, it isn't. No. So all, for people that are struggling with this, don't try and stop it. No. Find a different outlet yeah. for it in that's much more positive. Yeah. It'd be like, some, for example, if you had a load of power, is a good analogy, and you're a dictator, you could go and do genocide and kill a load of people, yeah. or you could go and try and save and increase the <laughs> and build on humanity. Yeah. With that power, you could do both. They're both fo the amount of focus, the same amount of like time and effort gets put into them. But one's more positive. One's more the positive. One's like, so, and, and all it is is just shifting it, and I think that will help someone then. Shift over. Eddie Hall, right? Yeah. I was very close to Eddie Hall. Well, I know, like, knew him, and we used to train at the same time at Strength Asylum. I used to have conversations with him at the, the tables in Strength. He obviously won the World's Strongest Man, and he did everything in the, the, the lead up to that year to, to win. Mm. And I know from having spoken to him that after the he won, and he had to stop because of health issues, he sank into a very yeah, unhappy yeah, place. Will. Because his whole life and his identity was anchored to that. that what he did was is realized that actually, okay, he's that personality type and he always has to have something. No, he shifted to business. Mm. And now he's on social media yeah. constantly and he's, he's doing brilliantly well and he looks as happy as he's ever looked. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah, and I think a lot of the time people, as you, you made a great point there, I think people go from all or nothing. They go, they go, they, they, that's the, that is the key point is they have this laser focus through this period of prep as an example where 
you know, they make sure they go to sleep at the same time, they wake up at the same time, they eat their meals at the same time, they don't miss a step, they don't miss a cardio session. They go through this like relentless kind of everything for this one this one particular goal, which is to step on stage. And once that's done, a lot of the time people just go, I'm just gonna stop everything now because it's done. And that's coming back to what you said, the all or nothing, that's where it just goes wrong because you can't go and you can apply that, well, I've just said that principle to even business. Like you couldn't mm-hmm. go from working how you do now, as relentless as you just did, to then someone says to you, do you know what, mate? I want you to just do nothing for a week. You'd, lo- heart attack. you'd lose your fucking mind. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and you, you can apply that principle to a well, lot of things. What happened to you when you did that? Well, I, to well, be honest, no, this last week. Yeah, like... You got I, ill. Yeah. I got, yeah, physically got yeah, ill. From a work aspect, yeah, exactly that. Because you that. did, because you yeah. shocked your body. Exactly that. It's not healthy. No. It, it, and that's, you, do you know what, yeah, it's a great point because it is just going from all well, or nothing. Another example of this as well, if you take an alcoholic off of alcohol overnight, quite often they die. Game over. Yeah, the same as you, you, any addiction. You can't go from being addicted to stone cold. It shocks the body. Yeah. We're not designed no. for massive change. No, absolutely. Completely agree. Do you feel like with coaching, there's a, there's a moral component there for coaches to kind of recognise those traits within people and to help mitigate and even possibly to suggest that they shouldn't be competing. Absolutely. Like, uh, but I think the difficult part, I think, with that, so for someone like me, mm-hmm. yes, that's very easy for me to do. I think the difficult part for a lot of coaches now, coming back to our point earlier about walking the walk, if you haven't walked the walk, mm-hmm. you don't necessarily know the consequences of that. Mm-hmm. Or even if you have, you know, prepped a couple of people, you know, because some people do sky for it, plain sailing. You know, like I said, I, I find it quite easy. Mm-hmm. I do find it easy. Um, you know, if you've got limited experience with dealing with them types of people, it's then quite hard to be able to recognise that. Yeah. And I think that only comes from experience. You know, I've probably prepped maybe 300 people, 400 people now. Um, so I've been through so many different experiences, mm-hmm. male, female, young generation, older generation. Um, <clears throat> you know, the male and female contrast is, is crazy different. Um, you know, and a lot of people won't necessarily realise that until you go through that with people, you know, I always find like into a prep going, getting up to stage, gals handle it way better than men. Mm-hmm. Um, but I ask the gals are fucking relentless. They, they're so good. You know, you tell them they've got to do an hour on the Stairmaster every day. Yep. No problem. Yeah. You tell a guy he's got to do half hour. Oh, really? Right. You know, they're relentless, but then that period after the guys handle it way better than the females handle it. And I always say that because, you know, for, and maybe not so much for you actually, but my normal analogy that I would say in this scenario, you know, after that show period, you start to gain a bit of weight. From a guy's perspective, you know, if you go into your wardrobe and you stick a t-shirt on and you're like, oh, it's too small. Mm. Fuck me, I'm moving up to XL now. You know, I'm fucking getting bigger. Yeah. You know, most guys as a rule will like that. I say you're not so much for you because you're down to <laughs> yeah. But yeah. most guys as a rule, you know, will go, yeah, I'm getting bigger, I, I like this, you know, whereas from a female aspect, you know, I'm sure if your missus puts a dress on and it's too tight for her and it don't fit, she's probably going to throw it at you, tell you you're an idiot. And you're she will do when I've told her she's fat. And, and, you're not going, <laughs> and, you're, and, you're not, and you're not going out for the night, you know, you're just about to go out for this nice dinner, that dress she's just put on don't fit her anymore, well, you're going to yeah, get I'll it in the night. Yeah, I'll probably cancel the dinner as well, no, I'm joking. But, um, but you know what I'm saying, like, and that's, that, yeah. you know, the emotions and obviously from a hormonal standpoint as well, but that's where you see a lot of the differences, so... You know, it's hard, I think, for a lot of coaches today that haven't necessarily had that level of experience to to be able to identify those things. But it's definitely something that, certainly from from how I feel about it now, that people need to be a lot more aware of. Yeah. Because do you think do you think coaches have a responsibility to like pull the plug? Absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. I've done it multiple times. Okay. Yeah. Um, where I've had people, where I'm like, this is this is done. Yeah. Like we're done. You know, you get through somebody who's going for a prep and they're you know four or five weeks out and they've had an episode of binging, you know, and then they go back on plan, they binge again, that's the time, because it's only going to get worse from mm-hmm. there. When somebody is pre-show, is in a period where they are binging, you have to pull the plug, because if they are binging with that goal in mind now, the aftermath of that is going to be so much worse. Mm-hmm. Because after, it, you know, if, if, you know if, if I'm telling all my mates that I'm competing on this day and, you know, I'm dieting, there's going to be a huge part of me that doesn't want to, doesn't want to fail, mm-hmm. you know. And if I'm binging at this point and failing, when that goal has been removed, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, at that point, people become uncontrollable mm-hmm. around food and things like that. And then once it's then uncontrollable with no goal, 
it's only going to end in a disaster. Yeah, really. What to what sort? Of, it, it, so with that in mind, to what extent do you think the responsibility lies with the individual that's competing versus the coach? It's it, it's it's very difficult because you would like to think that as individuals we should be able to take responsibility for our own actions, mm -hmm. but when you are so deep into it and you know if you've been working towards this goal for such a long time and you can feel it creeping away from you you don't want it to creep away from you yeah so you will try and in your head try and do everything in your power to to prevent it do you know what i mean you know if you're looking at like you know if you switch it on the other head and you'll have a goal of getting a lamborghini and you're getting closer and closer to it and it starts to feel like it's falling away you're going to keep trying to do whatever you can to keep chasing it right mm -hmm. um so I think there's definitely a big reliance on the individual, absolutely, but um, being able to have that relationship with your coach where ultimately you can work together to decide what is the right co what outcome is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, I've, I've done it multiple times. I've pulled people and they might not be happy at that point. Um, yeah. But in my opinion, I have a duty of care as a coach to do what I believe is the right thing for you. And if I think the right thing for you is to not do it, if, a, if that person still wants to pursue it, in, in, for me at that point I would still just say that I'm not going to do it mm -hmm. like I wouldn't I wouldn't allow if I don't feel that it's right for someone to continue I wouldn't allow them to continue under, under me yeah like if they want to leave and go elsewhere then fine because I, I feel like I'm then doing the right thing mm -hmm. yeah because I mean we've we've experienced similar sorts of things from a business mm -hmm. coaching perspective obviously working with coaches like for example now if we actually know that uh, a coach is coming to us wants business manager help to grow their their business and they say oh yeah i'm actually going to be competing in two three months time we just flatly say no like we don't want any part of that yeah. anymore and then we actively discourage it for most people like when they're actually with us if they're kind of like three four five six months in they're yeah. like oh i'm thinking of competing like that's the time we sit down and have like very serious conversations with people be like look we've seen countless people up to this point like fuck their lives yeah. like ruin everything get into that cycle of anxiety depression it's a really difficult thing to do it and it's is. really difficult to know until you've actually built that very personal relationship with people like can someone get through it well yeah and the thing is as well like when like you say that and that's really key because that personal relationship because it's like you're almost dictating to that person what you think they should do yeah. you know and some people will go who the fuck do you yeah. think you are to tell yeah. me what you want to do? Like, I'm coming to you. I want to give you my money. I want you to help me. And you're telling me well, no. Well, that's, that's yeah. the doubt. Well, that is the onus is on you, though. So I, I would take that responsibility on board. So yeah. I think that is why you're paying me. That's exactly what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's um, exactly what I'm here for. I'm your yeah. fucking safety net. I'm your safety pins and your squat rack. And this is why I come <laughs> yeah. back to the point of me saying as like a duty of care as yeah. a coach. Like, you know, fucking because right. I'm doing the right thing. I, I need yeah. to feel like I'm doing the right thing. Because if I'm not doing the right thing, then... But to go back full circle with this as well, because I fucking love the coaching industry. Mm. Like, I think I was in Bulgaria the other day and our, we had literally hit our thousandth coach that we've been taught since we started. Mad. Over, that got over 5K revenue per month. It's a fucking, and I'm, I'm, I've worked with people now, similar to yourself, up to literally I've got guys doing seven figures on their own with one member of the staff. Mm. Like, when I say seven figures, that's over a million quid a year profit on their own with one member of staff. Like half of them are living in Dubai, paying no tax, having like, and, and they're in their early 20s. Yeah. So the coaching industry is insane. Yeah, it is. What we're saying, I think everything can be insane providing you apply the right mentality to it. So can bodybuilding. Like I attribute my bodybuilding career, if you want to call it that, or my journey, to a lot of the success I've had in life and the cars you see on the driveway and the, the house that yeah. I've got and the, the lifestyle that I've got. It's awesome. Yeah, and I think just as you just so I don't move off like come off this point, but I think what I always talk about the, the bodybuilding like a genuine and it's it's interesting actually that we've both got that bodybuilding background and we have the success that we have, mm -hmm. and I think it comes back to without being too kind of cringe and cliche, but it's just that pursuit to be better. It's that constant, but bodybuilding is about being better all the mm -hmm. time. It's never you don't all of a sudden go into a gym and go. Or oh, do you know what? I'm I'm gonna start lifting lighter than I ever have done now. But but different, diff, diff, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Like in this, but you're not technically joking, bodybuilding now. No, do you know? I'm but joking, yeah. if you are into bodybuilding, it's about you know from certainly from a male aspect, it's about getting bigger, lifting more, looking better. There's no aspect of it that, as an individual, we don't want it to be better. And I think that personality trait has carried through 
into business for me. One of the main things I look for in anyone I employ now, and I employ a lot of people, is mm. the fact they go to the gym. Mm. It's a massive red flag to me when some of the guys are going to yeah. the gym. Because it's not that the gym skills that you acquire no. are going to be in any way, shape, or form applicable to growing a business, but the attributes required to turn up to the gym every single day and be there. Put yourself in an uncomfortable position, yeah. make yourself lift some heavy fucking shit when you're tired and stressed out. Yeah. Is a, a mindset that carries over into everything in yeah. life if you want to be a successful person. Yeah. So I do think that that's why when you go to the gym car park now, we turn up at Phoenix Gym, mate, half the cars are fucking supercars. Yeah. And it's because the people that go to the gym typically have the same mindset and, and attributes. And this is why I get upset because I see so many fucking people that have it that know they know want to build this financial security, but don't understand that they're putting everything into bodybuilding mm. when if they split it and do a hybrid approach yeah. like we both have, can make so much fucking success out yeah. of it. And it might just be a matter of speaking to someone like myself or you that says, how do I just build this fucking coaching business and also do this? Yeah. Because it's not that hard. You can do it. You're yeah. already doing the hard yeah. shit. Yeah. So it's just a slight different shift in strategy and moving things out. And all of a sudden you can have it all because as we've found out, when you start getting to your 30s and you do become an old fart and your knees hurt and you don't actually want to do this stuff anymore, the one thing you do have left is the then ability to build your business yeah. now because you can't keep building your body at the same level, no. especially the way we did it, it yeah. not the way we yeah, did and it. Yeah, and I think it's a good point what you say. Like, you know, If I'm talking about like actually people that I engage with and know, two of the most successful people I know is you and Nick. Um, I've met you both in bodybuilding, pushing consistently as we do like for me you know i wouldn't be where i am if i didn't go into bodybuilding you know so i think we've obviously talked quite a lot about some of the negative aspects but mm. they, these are definitely some of the positives yeah. because you know i think you've just said the same and i think if you said the same to nick and i said the same we probably wouldn't be as successful as we were if we didn't get into bodybuilding for example if you said elliot if you went back would you not do bodybuilding fuck no of course you wouldn't i would do it every single time yeah. I would just be a little bit more careful with the strategy that I implemented with the business as yeah. well. And also realize that now you can actually do both and be yeah. successful at both. Well, yeah. And I think like you've just said as well, like if you didn't ever get into bodybuilding, would you have had a mentoring business where you've co helped a thousand online coaches to be successful? You may not have even got into that industry because you may not have even had an interest in it. I mean, one thing that Ed, you know, my performance enhancing yeah. coach has actually said to me recently is it was quite profound actually. He, we talk a lot about managing stress, uh, mm. mental stress, because yeah. you know running a business is fucking stressful. Mm. I'm not saying it's not. So he's going to the gym. He said he's less worried about me than his other clients when it comes to stress because I, I have a lot of stuff on my plate. As Marcus knows, there's a lot of shit that I have to eat every single day. I love it, by the way. I'm not complaining. Yeah. Not very, no victims here. Um, I put it on myself and I enjoy it. But that with that comes lack of sleep. It comes a lot of pressure, lots of responsibility, and it does take its toll. Of course. And I said to him, I was like, well, he said, you are very well fucking prepped for it because of the physical stress you put yourself under through bodybuilding. Mm. Because he said that your ability to handle mental stress is predominantly predicated by your ability to handle physical stress. And your body, what did he, what did the quote was he said? I think it was saying along the lines that mental stress has a physiological response mm. with it every yes. single time when you're putting your body under physiological stress. It so, prepares you for that mental state. So when a, a big episode of mental stress hits you, your body doesn't respond to it. Yeah. You're used to it. You're used to your adrenal spiking. You're used to heart rate increasing. You're used to being tired and yeah, you can just get that, through that, it. That's a good point when you talk about heart rate and you talk about like being tired and stuff, you know, Jordan Peters leg days, mate. I'm sure they, <laughs> I'm sure they created you. Do you know what I mean? But you know, we all Dude, know. Like, I'll tell you a story quick, actually. The best, the biggest session we ever had. So just to, for a leg yeah. session. James Holling said, obviously he's competing in Mr. Olympia yeah. this year. We had Donna, uh, no, Sasan Hirati. He, yeah. he, he was, uh, I think he just finished the New York Pro. Yeah. Jordan and me, mm. right? <laughs> and we've been, we've been making this fucking, this, this leg day been planned for ages. It was biblical. Yeah. I've never, I've never, I, we didn't get on camera. It was like one of those ones I'm kind of happy it was on camera because yeah. it's one that I remember a lifetime. And we all turned up to the gym. I mean, no one spoke. You know, everyone's, everyone's just fucking turn up. And what, what we what we kind of agreed was, is I was pairing up with Sasan. So it was a competition right. because he and I were quite equal uh, strengths. And James and James Jordan, and Jordan were like, just over well, there. Yeah, they were doing some city. I mean, I was strong as fuck, but these guys are like yeah. powerlifter strength. Yeah, yeah. And 
So we're in the leg room, it's straight to asylum, and we're doing like some, some standard hand curls, some single leg hand curls. No one says a word. So I thought, I'm going to have a bit of fun with this. I, I don't know if they'll remember this, they probably will. I hope they watch it. I went up to, um, I went up to James, because James and I get on really well. He's a lovely guy. Yeah. And uh, I went, Jordan's been, because I train with Jordan every day. Yeah. I went, Jordan's been talking about how he's going to fucking wipe the floor with you today. <laughs> don't tell him I said that, but he's like, I'm going to fucking destroy him. He's been training for this day. He's like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, yeah, he wants to actually like embarrass you. And like, you see me fucking yeah. psyched up. And I was like, this is going to be so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started doing the same to Jordan. Yeah. And mate, I got those two absolutely fucking riled. They wouldn't talk to each other all yeah. day. And then and James come up to me going, Jordan, Jordan wraps his legs wraps wrong. Like, Doug, I think he's gonna, he's not going to do as well. So like, I, I know how to, I was like, literally, it just became this thing. <laughs> and then we had the Cybex hack in, in strength side in the back yeah. room. So we did our, warmed up hamstrings, it was straight into, uh, I think we did a couple of like, really light leg yeah. extension warm-ups to get the yeah. knees going. And then it was like Cybex hack. And, <clears throat> oh my God. What happened was, it was like, when everyone was on the machine, it was like camaraderie, everyone got around. Yeah. But I remember at one point, I, so I think I started, so I set the tone. And I did the most ridiculous set. I mean, every set we ended up, it got to the point where you had to end up flat at the bottom right. and they had to lift you out. Yeah. It was, every single set was like that all day. <laughs> I had James Hollingshead in my face, I had Jordan Pease and Sasan screaming yeah. at me like, fucking more! Mate, people in the gym were like, what, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> and like, we had all the plates. Yeah. And then like, every single set was like that. And I, I remember leaving there. I, I don't think I, I got out of bed for like buried. a week, but I was buried. <laughs> but that is the kind of shit that we used to do. And like, like honestly, when I say we, it got to the point where you collapsed, we weren't allowed off the machines until, until the machine would squash you in the bottom yeah. and then they'd lift you out. And I think we're just going back to the point of what we're saying. I loved when, it. When, but when you've done, <laughs> when you've had that physical stress like that, mm -hmm. Like mental stress from a work standpoint, it, uh, it's you. They're similar. You can get similar feelings of and emotions, but that is coming back to you. It does. I mean, it does you make can't, you ready you can't for it. mentally put yourself under that pressure. No, like there's no. no way you can do that. So no. you, you're pretty prepped. Yeah, absolutely, completely. Agree. We've um, we're in the very early stages of planning um, a I don't know, so it could be like a, an ongoing series of events for Limitless. Yeah. Obviously, we work with so many people in so many different industries. We work with loads of the young guys in ecom. We work with fitness coaches. We work with like some security companies, where, wherever it's loads of people. One thing we experience across the board is people haven't actually ever experienced mental stress like to that kind of extent so we were kind of like, how can we actually sort of set a benchmark for stress tolerance of people and so we are in the early stages of basically planning just a really gnarly weekend that's just going to be hell, hell. for yeah, people it's and it's to do that same thing it's to be like show people that they actually are a lot mentally tougher than they think they are they can push themselves a lot further and it's to kind of just set that mm. benchmark so that when business gets slightly tough you might have had a few yeah. client drop-offs yeah. you're like oh actually this is easy compared to it what i was doing last weekend it makes total sense completely yeah. doesn't it yeah 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 I rate that it's how we introduce that kind of extreme bodybuilding element without literally crushing also, people yeah. to death it'd be interesting to see how people handle it though i mean i mean i'll probably die because i won't quit you know like we I, said that that's the danger yeah. it's like there's a few people that is like <laughs> will go until they die <laughs> but it'd be interesting what we, i think would be really interesting though is when you've done it to see how, as you kind of continue to work with people and see them develop, if those people then become your high achievers. Yeah, 100%. It'd be really yeah, interesting yeah, to see if that, yeah, that's like yeah. a good little test, because mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see if that is the case. Yeah. Because it would back up what we're ultimately saying, wouldn't yeah. it? I mean, from you, from your perspective, like, because I know a lot, there's a lot of people that have coaches that work like with you in terms of you teach them how to coach, mm. and there's a lot of people that follow you that are coaches. What would you say is, what advice could you give them for 2024 like, oh. to build it? Like, come on, let's do one of these ones. Let's wrap up with that. <laughs> I think I meant, I didn't, without again being too like, but I, I, what I said, being, 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 being cheesy as you being, want. But being relentless, like I, you have to be relentless in coaching. Like it's such, for me, it's such a saturated and What market. does that mean to you? I think it means don't give up until you get there. Like, you know, I see people all the time. You, I think it's such a saturated market that you get so many people that think what they can do is they can put a couple of reels out a week and they expect it to come to mm -hmm. them. It doesn't work like that. Like, you need to be fucking relentless. Like, you know, when if something's not working, try something different. Like, you need to be doing stuff that's different. Like, what I think will make you stand out from the rest is 
don't follow the crowd. Like, if you've got 15 people all doing the same thing, why would someone come to you? Do something different. Um, I think, you know, I think a good example of someone, not necessarily from an online coach's standpoint, and some people like him, some people hate him, but when I look at someone like James Smith, he's controversial as fuck. Like, that's what I think people need to do to be... You need to do something like that to be different because if you're just matching in with the rest of the market, someone's not going to choose you. Um, so, uh, to me, I think you need to be fucking relentless, don't stop, but also, you need to be different. Like, if you're doing the same as everything that everyone else is, I don't think you're going to be successful that way, personally. That's some of the points that I think. Um, I think, and I think also, like, people need to actually do their job. That's one thing that I find in the market at the moment. Like, I get people come to me all the time where, People say, yeah, I've left this coach because they're taking three days to respond. Like, you, you can't do that. Like, that's a big thing in the online coaching industry at the moment. Like, st like, spend time focusing on dealing with your clients and doing your job correctly, then focus on the rest. Like, I see people just doing so many, so many bits of content all the time, content, 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 but they can't actually do their job. So what's the fucking point in doing content? If, you, if you've got no retention and you can't keep your clients, why bother? Like, I'm not somebody who, and obviously I'm very established, so word of mouth and people know me, so it's, it's slightly different for me, but you won't see me continuously banging out content day in, day in, day out, because I'm, I'm working with my clients and doing my job. Like, my retention is fantastic, and the reason my retention is fantastic is because I care, and I look after people, and I do my job, like, and I think that's a big problem for the moment. So for, for coaches that are out there now, like, do your job. Like, actually do your job and help your clients. Like, be there for people that actually need you rather than just focusing on trying to reel in the numbers. Fucking love that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think. If you enjoyed the video, guys, like, subscribe, all that jazz. No, um, jazz. Find us all on social media. It's Jake Watts. I'll put the socials below on yeah, whatever perfect. platform we're streaming it on. Thank you very much for joining us, mate. Thank you. Appreciate no problem. It. Enjoy I want to say the same to you, but I see you every day, so <laughs> <laughs> on the next one. Peace. Cheers.